It's time for the 1430 Connection on 1430 WNAV and 99.9 FM. Spotlighting news, newsmakers, and important community issues. Now, with this week's edition of the 1430 Connection, here is WNAV news anchor Donna Cole. Welcome to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. In the studio with me today is Paul Spadaro. He's the president of the Magathy River Association and vice president of the same organization, Dr. Sally Horner. Thank you both for joining me today. Glad to be here. So you both released recently, within the past six days actually, the uh, State of the Magathy River Report, yes? That is correct. Tell me what sort of summarize what you found in the year 2016 with the Magathy River. Is it great? Is it 100% healthy? Can we just say, okay, everything's oh, yeah. perfect? We, we, have some, we have some good things. It's not all bad. I think one of the, the takeaways is that the main stem of the Magathy is doing fairly well. The main stem, if you think of the Magathy, as as your hand with your net with the wrist as the opening the palm is around Dobbins Island and the creeks as the fingers the palm area is doing very well it the, the problem has always been in the creeks and in the fingernails okay for our listeners for those that like may have just moved to Anne Arundel County Tell, tell everyone where the Magathy River is, where it starts, where it ends. All right, the Magathy River basically is, is between the Severn River or Annapolis and Baltimore. And it starts pretty much where Mountain Road, at one point College Parkway and Route 2. Up in Severna Park. Up in Severna Park. That's okay. where the, the, the bulk of the Magathy is. And it dumps out right into the Chesapeake Bay. And if yes. you've uh, well, flown into BWI or out of BWI, you're probably getting a heck of a nice view of yes. the Magathy on your way yes. in or out. You fly right over it. You right. fly right over it, and you see Dobbins Island and, and Little Island. And what you really notice, and what we've been seeing in our in our Magathy River water trail, we do a lot of the drones, is that there is a lot of trees that are bordering the Magathy River. It, it does not look like an urban watershed. Um, speaking of which trees, in the Capitol, March 5th, headline reads, County releases new data on trees. Forest replacement rate remains about 10%, one of the lowest in Maryland. We're not planting enough trees. So when there's a development coming in that may be clearing trees, there are requirements to plant X amount of trees. Is this a problem? On This is a huge problem for us. And you can see as you drive up and down Route 2, there's some uh, new new uh, project sites that are being built where they've completely cut away the trees. It's one of the bigger problems that I've seen in the last 20 years, and I've been president of the Magathy River Association about that long, is that the developers are are, are developing their property today is that they're really just stripping the entire land. Clear cut. Clear cutting of that. And you just simply cannot replace a 30 inch oak tree with a half inch sapling out of uh, Home Depot. What do the trees do for those that don't know? Well, the trees do, uh, do a number of things. The most obvious thing that they do is they help really remove some of the nutrients through the through the roots. The other thing that they do for the for the watershed and for the rivers and for the general environment is they are actually uh, cooling uh, through transpiration, cool the atmosphere. And when you begin to remove trees, you begin to heat up the surrounding atmosphere. One of the most interesting things that has come out of last year's State of the Magathy was that we, because we have 24 monitoring stations around the Magathy River, we were able to document that we had an 8% temperature increase in the water temperature wow. of last year, which is significant. And it was perhaps one of the reasons why the Magathy has slipped backwards somewhat. One of the thought processes that came out after the Ellicott City floods was that the at the top, the very top of the town, up above Ellicott City, you had lots of these developments coming in and clear-cutting the trees, which then had, right. and even though these floods have happened in Ellicott City for a number of years, mm -hmm. that could have contributed to this. Oh, well, it, right? well, it really yeah. does. I mean, when you, when you look at um, stormwater runoff, which is one of the major problems in all the watersheds on the western shore, uh, what is not realized is when you do clear cut the trees, you automatically increase the amount of runoff by 67 percent, mm. which uh, the developers are required to mimic the uh, forested land cumber 
and this is the squashy word that makes it, it things don't work out right is to the extent practical so what actually is the extent practical does that mean their stormwater controls should be one percent two percent three percent four percent they should be 67 percent and it's certainly not the case and that's why you have the flooding in ellicott city let's let's get back into the 2016 state of the magathy river you uh, wrote although some creeks in the magathy showed improvement in water quality between 2015 and 16 the overall index for the river declined from 33 percent to 28 percent a rate of 28 is a it's a D D, D. that's a D so our magazine we're a generous grading scale yes so, so we need to bring that letter grade up yes we do and how do we yes, go we about do. doing it there are some things that individuals can do that can really help uh, improve water quality one of them is to reduce their lawn particularly people who live close to the water right on the water if they can plant trees and shrubs in place of lawn, they'll uh, reduce the amount of stormwater runoff that enters the, uh, the creeks and the river, and that can really make a difference. People can plant uh, rain gardens so that they can take their downspouts from their roofs and uh, connect that runoff directly into a garden, which then sends the water eventually into the groundwater as opposed to creating runoff. This can really help improve water quality as something individuals can do right on their own property. To get back to reducing a lawn, that doesn't mean you have to move. It does mean that maybe many of us need to reconsider what makes a beautiful yard. Exactly. And it isn't exactly. necessarily green grass. Exactly. We yes. can put in beautiful native trees and shrubs. They don't require fertilizer, which is another big issue. You can often see in the summertime when you travel by those properties that are right on the water that are green lawn directly to a bulkhead, directly to the water. You can see the algal blooms, the green cast that is adjacent to those bulkheads. So bringing in the native plants is not only going to help the Chesapeake Bay, which helps all of us, including those not on directly living on the uh, water, mm -hmm. but also it helps the butterflies Absolutely. and the birds and the Absolutely. wildlife. This is habitat right. for all kinds of wildlife. So let's take a quick break. When we come back, let's continue talking about this. This is Donna Cole of 1430 Connection. We will be right back. Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. In the studio with me today is Paul Spadero. He's the president of the Magathy River Association and the vice president of the organization is Dr. Sally Horner, also here. We're talking about the state of the Magathy River. Uh, Paul and Sally just recently put out their state of the Magathy for 2016 and it got a letter grade of a D and that was generous according to Sally. We were talking about what people can do to help and Paul, you had something to add. What, what can homeowners and developers both do to help? What they should really do is to really limit the amount of tree cover that they remove. Uh, what isn't completely understood is that once you clear cut a, a lot for a home, it's going to take decades of over fertilizing to just even to restore a lawn, let alone a tree that, a mature tree that will take 30 or 40 years to grow. And here's an interesting concept. We're, as consumers, as homeowners, as home purchasers, we're normally leaning on the developers to do everything right. Maybe we need to start saying, I don't want to move into a community where it's clear cut, especially when you're in on the Chesapeake watershed. Can we ask our developers, not just the government representing us, can we as consumers say to our developers enough? Well, at some point in time, even the best hotel has to put up the no vacancy sign. And with the creeks and rivers on the western shore we're right at that at that particular point again what is not so obvious when we see a development that is sort of clear cut like that the trend in the county right now is to make that development pay for the maintenance of its stormwater facility so as long as there's no tree cover you're subject to that again whatever the leftover from the extent practical is from the original tree cover you're going to have to maintain and what's the re planning rate established by law one for one or that's what they're trying to pass through uh, now. what it's is it now currently I you know I think it varies depending on what part of the critical area you're in but it's not more than one to four I don't think and, and I believe that's totally irre irre 
relevant because you're well. That's not so much. Is it irreal, It's unrealistic to think that somewhere you're going to have a developer that's going to be able to clear cut to ten acres of ground and find ten acres in this county to plant trees. And plus, you're not putting, as you said before, the same size mighty oak. Right. Uh, but even, but even, 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 yeah. even the yeah. point is, where are you going to find ten acres to plant trees? Right. It's just an unrealistic law, a feel-good thing that instead of what they should do is be really harder on the developer for not clearing the trees and more fines for taking those trees away and putting it back into appropriate things that are going to do better than to say a 1 to 1 or 10 to 1 or 21 when there's no land to plant the trees. All right, let's get back to the homeowners. What can they do, waterfront homeowners do with regard to oysters that help filter the water? Bank of the River Association actually invented the oyster gardening program about 20, 30 years ago. And um, of course, Maryland Grow Oysters has now taken over that particular program, and it's definitely something you could do. One oyster does filter 55 gallons of water, and the oysters in the Magathy, we have divers go down and check, do fairly well. They do not reproduce. What I would recommend, in addition to doing that, is the use of floating gardens. Mm -hmm. And floating gardens, what they tend to do is you, it's, a, it's a natural emerging plant that is is anchored either individually or in a group of, of gardens together. And what they do is the only way that they can grow is to sort of start removing the nutrients out of the water, which is one of the problems. And then uh, they grow up and out of the water and their roots hang down uh, into the water and that provides excellent habitat for fish and then the other thing that's not so obvious is it does provide a little shading so it would begin to cool some of that warmer water. And these are floating right off the dock or right off the bulkheads? Of yes, they're either floating off the dock or off the bulkheads and last year we came out with a new single design that can be attached to each one of your pier pilings or each one of your bulkhead pilings that go up and down with the top and, and are there grants available to the homeowners to, or to the communities? To uh, these are relatively reasonable uh, gardens. Um, we were selling uh, single gardens last year to plant the tray and uh, for thirty dollars. Nice. So I mean, we're selling a, th a three um, three uh, system for a hundred dollars. So they're. You know, sometimes we get a little bit carried away about the grants that I think of individual responsibility. Uh, we can do a lot more. Um, and once people begin to see these floating gardens, the way the plants are, um, are set in place, that there should be at least one flowering plant every month. So you truly do have a garden in front of your house. And the fish love these. Yeah, yeah, the fish do great. They, uh, the roots hang down into the water. We see lots of little fish, crabs, and vertebrates there. It's a, it's a great habitat. And, okay. and they do, plants do what they're supposed to do is actually put the oxygen back in the water. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. okay, speaking of putting the oxygen back into the water, and what that means is uh, uh, waterways with a lot of oxygen w that are healthy mm -hmm. will have a, hopefully a lot of wildlife, including right. fish, including birds. Right. Right. So let's get back to those fish. Some of those types of fish they include yellow perch, yes, the anadromous fish, right? yes. yellow perch, white perch, the diff different types of shad. These are all the fish that are spawning right now. They come up into the into the freshwater non-tidal sections of the creeks and uh, they're spawning right now. When we come back, we're gonna talk about those fish. Okay. This is Donna Cole, this is the 1430 Connection. We will be right back. Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. In the studio with me today is Paul Spadero and Dr. Sally Horner. Paul is the president of the Magathy River Association and Dr. Horner is the vice president. Let's talk about fish in the Magathy River. Specifically, I want to talk about yellow perch, which according to a letter, Paul, you provided me with, this is dated May 20th, 2015, written by Gina Hunt, deputy director of the Maryland Fishery Service, going to Larry Tom, planning and zoning officer for Anne Arundel County. It's 
says, and I quote, unfortunately, the current conditions are not as favorable for successful reproduction as they were in the 1970s, and the Magathy River is very likely a reproductive dead end for yellow perch. That was, again, written in 2015. A video shot on February 27, 2017, by the Chesapeake Bay Program on the upper reaches of the Magathy River. Paul showed what? Showed that that certainly wasn't the case, and I bet now uh, Gina Hunt would love to have that letter taken back. We have been working with the community college, uh, Anne Arundel Community College, since the 60s, restoring yellow perch. We did that in the 60s. We certainly did that in the 80s, and we have... I'm really proud to announce that some steps that the county had done in the early 80s, buying up the right-of-way from Catherine Avenue to Lake Waterford, had protected the habitat. And as a result of that, in addition to the restocking efforts of the community college and Rundle College and MRA, that uh, we continue to have a yellow perch of an, an, and I might say, a healthy yellow perch spawn year after year. And the reason this matters so much for many of us that grew up in Maryland, yellow perch was very much part of our part of us, part of our communities. And then for a long time, we didn't hear much about yellow perch, and now all of a sudden, well, because the, the reason that you, that uh, now you're starting to hear of it because I forgot an uh, uncovered a, an unused little segment of the law in a critical area called habitat protective area. And it's a part of a state law. And what's really significant about that state law is that it uses the word shall. The county shall improve the water quality. And the county shall improve the forest land cover. And those two things are really important. Shall, in that legal sense, is mandated. Local jurisdictions, I'm reading, shall shall develop policies and programs for avoiding adverse impacts of any activities occurring on those portions of any watershed within the critical area which drain into anadromous fish spawning streams. So there has to be protections. Right, and right. It's all, long, but, long forgotten, never really deployed as practical as the original law was, but it's still active on the books. And when you say, you remember when you were a little girl and everybody was yellow perch fishing, what, you, what has transpired since that time is acre after acre of forested cover has been converted into development. And nobody's looking out for it, even though this is either critical area or right at the edge of critical area well, affecting right, right. the yellow perch. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. Among and that's why the habitat, variety. the yellow perch habitat, has totally been destroyed and decreased. And But Now, I have to say, at least the upper Magathy has the um, habitat that is supporting, and that's what that obvious video did show. Could there be, and I'm not saying there will be, could there be legal action to force counties to... Yes. Okay. Yes. This is is something that, uh, after studying this problem for about two years, it's something that I do realize right now is that our, our watersheds would have been in much healthier situation if the county had followed through with what it was mandated to do in 1986. Sally? Well, we took that statement from Gina Hunt and uh, also last year, 2015, at our State of the Magathy, um, uh, Jim Uphoff from the uh, Department of Fisheries from DNR also came to us and told us that yellow perch were at a reproductive dead end in the river. We took that as a challenge because we really felt that there were reproducing yellow perch. So we had a um, um, hunt that we organized for eggs. The eggs of the yellow perch are, are laid in these very distinctive accordion type cases. They're that fascinating are about a to foot see. Long. Yeah. yeah, they're about a foot long and you know a couple inches in diameter that you can't miss them. And so we went looking for them and we did find uh, over 200 egg cases in 2016. And then the next question is, well, do those eggs hatch? And lo and behold, there was this video and showing them. Right. Well, w- what we actually did in order to really show that those eggs hatch, because the fisheries has always said that those eggs will not hatch because the habitat is not right. Right. So we went out and did a survey for the larvae. We bought nets and we went out with DNR, assisted us in this work, and we were able to capture that little tiny, you know, microscopic, one third inch little larvae. Fascinating. Fish. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Paul? The thing to remember about the yellow perch is when you're protecting their habitat, you're actually protecting your habitat. We are going to continue
continue to work hard to restore the yellow perch. This year, we already voted to $300 for an, another modest restocking, and we plan on restocking the area around Cattell Creek up by Cattell Commons, the, the subdivision up there that's planned. That's great. Where can people find out more information about the Magathy River Association? We do have a website, magathyriver.org, and we also have a very active Facebook page. People yes. can find that at Magathy right. River Absolutely. Association. We post Magathy a lot River of things every day on our mm-hmm. Facebook page. Mm-hmm. All right, perfect. Yeah. Thank you both for joining me today here at WNAV. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank this you. Is, this is Donna Cole. This has been the 1430 Connection. We will see you next week.